¿Cómo estás, my amigas? I'm Justin, singer of Tala, and welcome to my laboratory. You may notice that it looks a lot like my living room. That's because it is my living room. I'm not a real scientist. I'm just playing one in this YouTube video. Today, we are going to be talking about the concept behind Tala's second album, The Generation of Danger. Before we get started, there are just two things, two little bitty things that I need you to put in your noggin, okay? Just two, two little things. Can you do that for me? Can you? Of course you can. I believe in you. I trust you. The first thing is, I understand that you love my Trifigy. I love Matrifigy. Everyone in Tala loves Matrifigy. It was a fantastic first album, and the story was so cool and so immersive. I'm sure you have questions like, what happened to Kungan? Who called the cops? If Tala's in a wheelchair, how did she get food? Because she's in a wheelchair, so how, how, did she, how was she able to travel to get food? For her, for her and Kungan. If she's in a wheelchair, how was she able to do that? How did Kungan survive having this horrible gash between his legs? Why were Kungan and Tala locked inside of this this building to begin with? And what the heck is up with Lobby Fu? I'm sure you have so many questions, and you were really hoping this next album would answer those questions, but it's not going to. I get how bad you wanted Matrifigy to continue. But the generation of danger is its own concept. It's its own independent story. The main character, Dicker Addison, he's his own person. I, the writer, am telling you any similarities or comparisons that you draw between the two albums in the lyrics, they're just Easter eggs. I put them there for you because I know how much fans love stuff like that. I know you're disappointed, but don't be. Shh. Shh. Don't be disappointed. I just didn't want to write a story like that. I already did that with Hungry Lights. The Hungry Lights concept takes place across five different albums. One continuous concept. But I didn't want to do that with Tala. I wanted it to be like, what's the word for it? An anthology. I think that's what it's called. When you have just independent stories all like in the same book or part of the same show. That's what's going on with Tala, okay? I'm sorry. I know you're disappointed, and I truly, truly empathize with you. It's okay to make fan fictions, but a fan fiction isn't canon to the story, okay? So just tuck that into your noggin. The second thing that I want you to just... Yeah, special beam cannon! Just, just put it in your brain. Is just like I said in the Matrifigy's concept series. Don't get tripped up on the literal story. Even though the concept series is telling you the literal story and kind of setting you up for a failure, I want you to analyze the lyrics and interpret them as if there is no concept. Not very many people did that with Matrifigy, and I get it. It's hard. But you have to imagine that all these things that I say, all these characters that I drop, imagine that they are all metaphors and similes and analogies for things that I want you to understand about yourself. If you have depression, if you have anxiety, if you are struggling with your identity or your place in this world, these lyrics can help you. And I get it, not everybody has like the right mindset to look at lyrics that way they might say no that that's right over my head i don't know what the hell you're talking about that's fine again i'm the creator i'm telling you there's way more to it i think you can do it i believe in you with that being said let's jump into the concept behind the generation of danger to get you started on understanding the concept behind the generation of danger I have to tell you some of the history about how we made this album. In 2018, after we finished writing the EP, No One Should Read This, Max and I began writing songs for the Generation of Danger. I believe we wrote Telescope first, and then we wrote Dicker's Done. If I remember correctly, those were the first two songs that we made 
on this album in 2018. I didn't have a concept yet. I just wrote whatever came to mind. And then when I looked at the two songs, I was like, all right, I guess the concept is going to be about some scientist guy who is kidnapping people and doing experiments on them because he wants to be recognized for his genius and feels like he hasn't really gotten enough attention for the work he does. In 2019, we wrote more songs for the Generation of Danger, and we were actually supposed to record this album in October 2019, and it was going to be our debut album. However, some things fell through, and we ended up making Matrifigy instead. The non-EP songs on Matrifigy were actually written after the majority of the songs on The Generation of Danger. So if you see people online saying stuff like, oh, I don't really like the direction that Tala went in with this new album. The, their old Matrifigy was just so raw and authentic, and now it feels like they just like sold out and it's not a good evolution of their music. You just got fact-checked because most of The Generation of Danger was written first. Anyway, long story short, in 2020 we released Matrifigy, and then in 2021 we started to tweak some of the T-God songs, and then we wrote more songs for that album, and then we recorded it, and now we're releasing it in 2022. But the coolest thing about this album is that when Max was sending me the instrumentals to write over, he didn't know what order he wanted to put them in. So, I had to write a concept that made sense no matter what order Max decided to put it in. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure. It wasn't like the No One Should Read This EP where Max was like, these are the five songs on the EP, this is the order they're going to be in, and I was just able to write this chronological story, and then when that turned into Matrifigy, I was just able to extend that a little bit and fill in the gaps. With The Generation of Danger, I didn't know what was going to be where. Obviously, your first listen through, you should listen to it in the order that we went with. But eventually, I encourage you, try like putting them in a different order and listen to it and following along with the story. It's still going to make sense. It's so cool. Now, let's talk about the characters because... Holy cow, there are a lot of them this time. Ten to be exact, but our most important character, of course, is our protagonist, Dicker Addison. He is a scientist, he is in his mid-50s, and he works for a corporation called Chromofix Industrial. This corporation is known for its advancements in medical science, and Dicker is the head scientist. He is a genius. He single-handedly has cured cancer. AIDS. He was even able to get amputee victims to grow their limbs back fully functional. That is how amazing and how brilliant Dicker Addison is. However, he works for this corporation. They fund his research, so they take the credit for the research. And to make things worse, they use someone else as the face of the research. Why do they do this? Because Dicker is an asshole. I don't know any other way to put it. He's very rough around the edges. He's very arrogant. He's impossible to talk to. He's just not pleasant to be around. Like, he's not the type of person to start a family. He's just weird. So they use somebody else for the face of the research, and they take his credit. He's just in the back solving every problem mankind has and not getting anything. No recognition. We'll get into it a little bit more later, but that's all you really need to know about Dicker for now. Next, we have Wendred Brody. Wendred is Dicker's lab assistant. He is in his mid-30s, and he's very, very clever. Dicker specifically chose him because he needed someone he could intellectually trust to assist him with this very delicate and life-altering research that he's been doing. Doing. You can think of Wendred sort of like a sidekick. Personality-wise, he's very protective. He's a big, burly dude. He's very warm. Kind of gives off the vibe of a bear. Next up on the list is Morton Frazier. Morton Frazier is in his mid-40s, and he is the CEO 
of Chromal Fix Industrial. For those of you who are unfamiliar with that terminology, it means that he is the chief executive officer. If that's still not doing it for you, it means he is in charge. He basically owns the company. He's the head honcho. He's the guy with the money. He's the big pig man. Morton is short. He's greedy. Morton is our antagonist. He's the reason everything that happens in this story happens. Hashtag screw Morton Frazier. Next up on the list we have Marissa Bailey. Marissa is in her early 30s and she is the CFO of Chromofix Industrial. That means she's the chief financial officer. She is also a Bitch, she is always hunched over and just like carrying her problems around on her back like a saddle. She reminds Dicker of a horse. You don't really need to know anything else about her. She's just not that important to the plot. But you know who is? Basil Sherman. Basil is in his early 40s and he is the vice president. He's very loud, he's very obnoxious, but he's also extremely loyal, always following Morton around and just doing everything he's told without question, kind of like a dog. Next up on the list is everyone's favorite character, the MVP of the Generation of Danger, Percival Vaughn. Percival is in his early 60s and he is the CTO of Chromofix Industrial. For those of you who don't know what that means, it means that he is the chief technology officer. <sighs> Percival is very weird. He's a weird guy. He's just weird. He's old and bald and he's got like liver spots on his head and he's cold all the time and his head is kind of shaped all wide and his eyes kind of bulge out of the side like a frog. Next up on the list is Quentin Toffer. He is the COO of Chromofix Industrial. That means that he is the chief operations officer. Quentin is in his mid-60s, and he always has sweaty hands. He loves to swim, and there's always a group of interns following him around, kind of like a school of fish. Next up on the list is Piper Huxley. I love Piper Huxley. God bless her little soul. She is the senior director of Chromofix Industrial. She is in her mid-40s, and she hates her job. She hates it. She wants to quit. She hates her position at Chromofix Industrial. She hates the people she works with. She just wants to leave. She wants to just, just leave and go fly around the world and go on an adventure. She wants to fly. She just wants to fly away. Like a bird. And in direct opposition to the lovable Piper Huxley, we have the annoying, narcissistic, piece of shit assistant director, William Fowl. William is just a horrible person to work with. He is in his late 30s and he is very, very tall. He's six foot nine. He could play basketball. In fact, if I wrote this character in as a basketball player on the side, it wouldn't be that weird because he basically just jumps onto other people's ideas and then gets them to rush it out and... It's not even done yet, but he's like, don't worry about it. I'll finalize it tonight. Just just, just get it out there. I'll take care of it. Don't even trip over it. And then he doesn't finalize it. He just pushes it on. And then because it's incomplete research, the person gets written up or worse, gets fired. And then William just hops out unscathed, just, just hops right out. And you know what else hops? Yeah, you know. You know what's coming. Grasshoppers. The last character in this tale isn't really like 
a character, but like it is, so I included it. It's of course the Insect Queen. Who the hell is that, Justin? I'm gonna tell you. The Insect Queen is Dicker's first like successful experiment when it came to creating organic life that could live and breathe and thrive on its own. Dicker essentially just keeps her as a pet in his lab. However, she is important to the plot, so I include her as a character. She is recurring. Hashtag all hail the insect. Okay, so now that we've gotten familiar with the characters in A Generation of Danger, and now that we've talked about how Matrifigy and The Generation of Danger are two completely different independent stories, and that any comparisons or similarities drawn between them are just Easter eggs for the fans, and now that you've promised me you swore on your life that after I tell you the plot of this album, A Generation of Danger, you'll also analyze and interpret the lyrics as if there is no concept at all. That way you can take away what I really want you to take away from them, and that you'll also do that for Matrifugy. I think it's time to give you the outline of what's going on in this gosh darn album. The first song on The Generation of Danger is... Mudcastle. Mudcastle is the intro to the album, and like Matrifigy, it's the end of the story. So all of the events preceding it are going to explain how Dicker Addison got in this predicament. What is the predicament? Well, we have to go to a magical city called Bruges in Belgium. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine that you are walking with a significant other down the streets of Bruges, during the evening, there's this beautiful bridge, a bus or a train or something passes under it, and then you just hear these footsteps, and you look up, and you see this middle-aged man with gray hair and a lab coat and a gas mask running full tilt across the bridge, carrying a box of research paper and test tubes and beakers and stuff's just flying out, and he's being pursued by at least a dozen cops. That is how the album starts. However, you're not going to get that from the lyrics, because I want you to look at these lyrics and say, what is Justin trying to tell me about myself? What does this mean? can't stress this enough. The next song on the album is The Hard Reset. This is track number two. However, the story doesn't start here. The album is not in story order. It's a choose-your-own-adventure, and this album order is the adventure that Tala chose to tell the story. For example, Shaken Not Stirred is track five on the album, but it's the first experiment that Dicker conducts. The Hard Reset and Stomping Grounds are also experiments, but they happen after Shaken Not Stirred. We specifically chose this album order because Musically, we felt like it flowed the best in terms of if this were a non-concept album and you were just listening to it the way you would listen to any album, it flows really nicely this way. It hits these highs and then it comes down and then Thistle is this explosive climax and it's like, wow, what an album. But concept-wise, it's not in chronological order. However... I'm going to tell you the chronological story, and then after you've listened to the album in the order we prefer you to listen to it in, then you can try to figure out what songs correlate with what parts of the story and put it in that order and then listen to it that way and see how different it feels. But I still want you to imagine Mudcastle as like, if this were a movie, that's how this movie is going to start. Then it's going to be chronological and get back to Mudcastle. 
Does that make sense? Please tell me it makes sense. If it makes sense, put it in the comments and give this thing a like because I'm going to rip out all my hair and punch my teeth out. After Mudcastle, the story officially starts. We have... Dicker Addison working at Chromofix Industrial. He's just completed this cure for this ridiculous disease that's just like killing people left and right all over the world. And stop. I know what you're thinking. Whoa, that's why Tala won't let Kungan outside and why they're locked. Is stop it. Cut it out. Dicker finishes making this cure for this disease. And the cure is nominated for a scientific breakthrough prize. Chromofix takes credit for it, of course. And then they put Quentin Toffer out there as like the spokesperson and the face behind the idea even though it was Dicker's idea and Dicker's research and he basically did it all himself. Quentin's good friends with Morton and he does really well on camera. He's super likable and they just feel like it's a good look for the company. Obviously, Dicker is outraged. He should be. He has every right to be upset because this isn't the first time it's happened. Almost all of his research has been nominated or won different scientific awards and prizes and every single time chromofix industrial takes credit for it and they put good old quinton toffer as the face of the labs dicker's just sick of it so he quits chromofix industrial he takes all of his research with him he drains his bank account and he spends time making a secret underground laboratory and no it is not tala and kungan's house stop just, I get it. I get it. You love Matrifugy, but it, two different things. Anyway, Dicker arms the entrance and exit with these, like, C4 trip mine explosive things so that if anyone were to discover the laboratory, it would just, like, go up in flames and there would be no connection to him. Why is he doing this? Well, because Dicker plans to kidnap all seven of the board members, which are those characters that I talked about earlier, not counting himself, Wendred, and the Insect Queen. And he wants to basically do vivisection on them to create these, like, human-animal, like, abominations based on the board members' deepest, darkest desires and their, like, personality traits. He wants to make a statement and be like, I see you. This is who you really are. You kind of think of it like um, the Island of Dr. Moreau or however you pronounce it. Fantastic book. Never watched the movie, but definitely took some inspiration from it. So, Morton Fraser's great-grandfather was the founder of Chromofix Industrial. This lineage is really important to Morton, so once a month, he says his board members have to go to this graveyard somewhere in Bruges and pay their respects to him. Dicker knows this, so he drives to this graveyard, and then once they go to the grave, he either, like, injects them in the neck with that stuff that, uh... Dexter uses to knock people out, if you've ever seen that. Took some inspiration from that, for sure. Sometimes he gets an old rag, and he just, Whoa, chloroform, and then gets them that way. But he kidnaps them one by one and does these experiments on them. It's not like in the music video for Telescope. It's not like he kidnaps them all at the same time and has this, like, mountain of bodies that he's going to experiment on. It's one at a time. That's his plan is to kidnap them and then to turn them into these animal things, okay? Dicker's first experiment, or should I say his first victim, is the obvious Quentin Toffer. This is the guy who's been the face of the research and has been pretending that he's the brains behind the operation. Everyone loves him, everyone adores him, and Dicker is just like, I freaking hate this guy. You're first. So he finds out when Quentin is going to go pay his respects in this graveyard. Dicker gets there first, and he gasses up the place to make it real foggy.
the whole point of him fogging up the entire cemetery is Dicker is like in his 50s. It just makes it easier for him to creep up behind and put chemicals into their brain. So he tranquilizes Quentin, brings him to his secret laboratory, and begins the experiment. Dicker has created this serum, and its whole purpose is to keep the victim conscious during the vivisection. If they lose consciousness, the entire thing falls apart. So Dicker needs to thoroughly test this serum and make sure that it works. He doesn't do that. He's very excited about getting started, and he gets impatient, and he just goes for it. Quentin loses consciousness halfway through the vivisection, and it's ruined. Dicker is enraged. He has not had a lot of failures and losses in his career, so he doesn't know how to cope with it. He just has this, like, half-alive, like, throbbing creature in front of him. He made a mistake. He's very upset by it. He doesn't want to look at it anymore, so he brings this pulsating abomination to a lake in the middle of the night, drowns it, and just leaves it there. The body of what was once Quentin Toffer is found, and it's all over the news. And Dicker gets so excited. Like, he's looking at the media attention that this failed experiment gets, and he's like, how crazy is it going to be if they get a live one? His plan slightly alters, and now he's like, I'm going to turn them into into these creatures and then release them into the wild. Upon realizing how sensitive of a procedure this is, Dicker does take the time to rework his serum and fully test it, and once he is absolutely positive that nothing can go wrong, he kidnaps Vice President Basil and begins the vivisection. It's a complete success. So the next night, he takes this human-dog hybrid creature, puts a collar around his neck, and then ties him to a tree in a local park, and then watches as the media loses their goddamn minds over the horror that they find. With the success of Basil Sherman... Dicker proceeds to get the CFO, Marissa Bailey, and turn her into a horse. He releases her on a local farm, and all of Belgium explodes with media coverage. But they are not calling it science. They are calling it a pattern of serial abductions, tortures, and murder. Dicker is frustrated with the way that the media is perceiving him. Obviously, they don't know that it's him doing this, but the fact that they're just labeling this person, this anonymous person that's doing this, as a serial killer or a criminal, he's like, like, I'm so much more than that. I'm a scientific genius. And he's very upset that they don't see that too. He's like, who else could do this? I'm taking what was once a human being, picking apart its character traits and its personality flaws and combining them with its secret, deep, dark desires hidden within the crooks of their being and evolving them into what they really are. He's like, no, 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 no. I am an artist and he's going to show them that. So the next thing he does is kidnap his fourth victim, assistant director, William Fowle, and he turns him into this bunny creature and releases him in front of a pet store in, like, a cage. And it's just like, how you like them apples, Belgium? At this point, I'm sure you have a burning question. What is Dicker doing with the body parts? Because he is taking humans, but he's removing things from these humans and adding things from animals. What is he doing to dispose of or discard like all this like flesh and tissue and bone around his laboratory? That's where the insect queen comes in. Like I said, she was his first experiment. She's this organic life that he created essentially like in a synthetic environment and it's alive. He feeds these parts to the insect queen. 
and that's that's her role in the story. All hail the insect queen. The media attention from Dicker's hybrid rabbit monster is not ideal. They are now calling his releases of these creatures the generation of danger. The news has spread from Belgium to the rest of Europe and even to the United States of America. Like, the whole world is talking about this horrible serial killer and dicker's fed up with it he's like all right if you guys want a murderer you're gonna get a murderer so he kidnaps his fifth victim of course everyone's favorite the mvp percival vaughn turns him into a frog monster and then one night he takes him out and pushes him in front of a semi truck because frogs often get run over by vehicles now, if you remember at the beginning of the video, when I was talking about Dicker's lab assistant, Wendred Brody, I said that he was very, very clever. He notices that board members are just not showing up for work at Chromo Fix Industrial. He notices Dicker's gone, and he notices all this stuff going on with the generation of danger. He puts two and two together. He finds out that Dicker drained his bank account, he finds the secret lab, and because he's so clever, he manages to get inside without tripping the C4 explosives. He finds the research, and he plans to tell the police and, like, expose Dicker, but Dicker sedates him once he regains consciousness. He's like, listen, you're my lab assistant. We've been working together for so long. Can't you see the beauty in what I'm doing? Like, you could be part of this. You could help me make this even better better and we could both go down in history of course Wendred wants no part in that at all so dicker has no choice but to add him to the generation of danger so he turns him into this bear creature takes him out to the woods films himself shooting Wendred with a hunting rifle packs it up and then sends it to city council obviously the city of bruges was not thrilled to receive this video however Dicker got cocky. Even though he has a gas mask, they do know that he is a white male, roughly how tall he might be, and they have an idea of his weight and age. So they start pumping police into the countryside. They're searching houses. They're stopping anyone who fits the description. It's getting very risky for Dicker, but he is determined to finish the generation of danger there are only two board members left so he does his thing he kidnaps poor poor piper huxley may she rest in peace and he turns her into this bird creature and then here's where he really messes up he decides to play the whole hiding a leaf in the forest game and he brings her to the top of chromo fix industrial and he's like you want to fly <laughs> my friend you will fly with the pigeons and then he pushes her off the top of the building and she hits a car and just <laughs> the problem is it was too close to home the police notice that the board members are missing and they also notice that dicker quit drained his bank account and disappeared they make the connection to the generation of danger and Dicker Addison becomes the number one suspect in this now nationwide manhunt. The good news is, or bad news, depending on how you perceive the situation, uh, Dicker is a genius, and he did foresee that he might be overstepping and getting a little cocky. So after he pushes Piper off the roof, hashtag rest in peace, Piper Huxley. He goes to Morton Fraser's office. Morton puts up one hell of a fight, but Dicker ultimately manages to sedate him, brings him to his lab, and begins the experiment. He does finish it in time. However, before he gets a chance to release this pig creature into the wild, he hears an explosion from the C4 at the entrance. He knows he's out of time. He just throws gas all over everything, gathers up as much research into a box as he can, and he sets the lab on fire, leaving Morton to burn alive as he 
goes through his exit and flees the scene. The story then kind of wraps back around to Mudcastle. And there you have it. Hooray! I hope you enjoyed learning about the literal concept behind the generation of danger. Once again, I encourage you to listen to the album in album order because that is the way that we in Tala intended for you to listen to it. That's the way it flows. That's the way the transitions are set up. However, once you've listened to it a couple times and you fall in love with it, go analyze the lyrics and try to put it together in chronological order and see how it feels or create your own adventure and see how that feels that's the beauty of this album is that it really doesn't matter what order it's in it's still gonna make sense just a friendly reminder also look at those lyrics and try to find what they mean without the concept of course share our music and videos with your friends with your community with your scene every little bit helps us grow and we really really appreciate it follow us on our other social media because you never know Know when we're gonna come play near you and it's such a cool experience to come see us live thank you for watching i love you so much i'm justin signing off oh, my hands are so sweaty